online from 7 to 8 p.m. It is on our website, on the church's website, as well as on our YouTube channel. So we encourage you guys to join us for Bible study on Thursday online from 7 to 8. Communion service. Communion service is the first Sunday of every month. This is our opportunity to get before the Lord, to examine ourselves so that he does not have to judge us. And this is also where we say we're able to get our strength, health, and long life. Ties and offering. We want to thank you guys for your continued support. Everything that we do here at this church is because of your faithfulness to the Lord. There are several ways that you're able to give. You can give online at our secure website, or you can text JCILM to 73256. You can also place it in the tithes and offering box, which is in the rear of the sanctuary, and some people will drop it off um, at the church throughout the week. Love Never Fails. Love Never Fails is our outreach ministry, which is spearheaded by Sister Lori. She does a great job coming up with different things for us to do to be able to share the love of Christ. Currently, we're still doing ministering to our military where they're able to receive a devotional as well as a journal. We have Mothers Who Mourn where we're able to give them a blanket as well as a devotional. And these are for mothers who have lost their child or children. And then we have our Build-A-Bear Experience, our blankets for seniors, and our Bibles for youth. We encourage you guys to go to our website, JesusLoveNeverFails.org, where you can keep up with everything that we're doing through the ministry. If you would like to give separately outside of your tithes and offering, you're able to do so, but you do not have to do so. But if you choose to, you can text JCILM Love to 73256. Our JCILM Youth Academy, it is up. Our kids are enjoying it. They are learning about the Lord. We are excited to be back there teaching. Their relationships are developing and growing as they learn about children. I'm going to say as they learn about Jesus. If you have um, children between the ages of 5 to 12 that you would like to be a part of that, you're able to um, register them through the Kid Check app. If you have someone that's coming to church with you that has children between that age, 5 to 12, we encourage you to have them go to our website. We have a link there where they can watch the video and learn the process about downloading the Kid Check app. We also have our sitting rooms in the back. We have a quiet room for mothers um, and fathers who may have a, a child that they want to just sit back there to nurse or feed the child, change the child. We also have our nursery that is available also in the back where there's a television where you can also be a part of the service and watch. And then we have our information table, which is now located in the rear of the sanctuary. On that table, we have our membership forms. For those of you that are interested in joining and you're not a part of the membership, membership yet, we ask you to fill out that form. You can drop it off in the media ministry. If you are a member, we ask you to get the form for your contact information to make sure that it's up to date and we have all of that so we can send out text messages, birthday cards, and all those good things. We also have on that table um, the form for the helps ministry. We have our application and our guidelines. If you want to join the helps ministry and it's something that the Lord has placed on your heart, Grab a copy of the guidelines, review it, and then the application. You can also drop that off in the media ministry. And then also we have our children's dedication and baptismal forms. If that's something that you're interested in, fill out that form. We'll get in contact with you and we'll set that service. At this time, Sister Miranda will come forward with a prayer and devotional moment. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to our online audience. If you have a prayer request or praise report that you would like brought forward, there are pens and cards located in the rear of the sanctuary as well as in the lobby. You can fill one of those out, place it in the box, bring it forward, and we'll pray with you corporately. If you are online, if you're on the church's website, there's a request prayer tab there. You can hit that tab, put in your prayer request there, or you can go to the contacts tab page to put in your prayer request. If you are on YouTube, you can tap, type your prayer request in the text box and we will bring them forward and we will pray with you and praise with you corporately. So I, ha I do have a couple prayer requests today. Um, we have one that's by uh, Sister Sean Collins and we did this one in Bible study on Thursday, but she's asking us to pray for her mother, um, Miss Delencia Cager, um, and she has some health issues going on. So we'll continue to pray for her. We also received a prayer request from Sister Sheila. She's asking us to pray for Brother Eric um, and his family and his father because his father was rushed to the hospital. So we will pray for them as well. And also a prayer request for myself for the Tate family. Um, they had a loved one to pass, ago, pass away a week ago today and they uh, buried her on yesterday. So I want to pray for them as a uh, corporate family and lift them up in prayer as they go through this time of bereavement. So if you will bow your heads, we will pray for them at this time. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again in the name of the Lord Jesus. We just thank you, Father God, for who you are. We thank you, dear Lord, for the protection that you have over our lives and how you cover us every day and watch over us, dear Lord. We thank you, Father God, for Sister Sean Collins and Sister Sheila and Brother Eric for bringing these prayer requests before you. So, Father God, we will lift these people up to you now and ask that you would watch over them. For Sister Sean's mother, we pray, Father God, that whatever health issue she has going on, dear Lord, that you would heal her from the crowns of her head to the soles of her feet, as well as Mr. Eric's father, dear Lord. Your word tells us that you are a healer, dear Lord. And as we read your word, we see that every person that Jesus came into contact with, he healed them no matter what the disease was, Father God, from leprosy to being maimed to raising people from the dead. So we know and we believe, Father God, when you say that you are able to heal us and we come standing on your word right now, dear Lord, lifting up Sister Sean's mother to you as well as Brother Eric's father to you. We thank you, Father God, for the healing that you have said is already ours and we stand on your word, Father God, and we pray that the people around them will continue to lift them up in prayer, dear Lord, so that the prayer and, and that they would go to the ones that are the elders of their church, dear Lord, so that their heads can be anointed with all, so that the prayer of the sick, can, the prayer of the faith will save them, Father God, and they will be healed and they will be forgiven of their sins. So we pray right now, dear Lord, for your healing to be manifest in their life. We pray, Father God, for the Tatum family. We lift them up to you right now. Dear Lord, whenever we lose a loved one, we are sad here on this earth, Father God, but your word tells us that you are the healing healer of broken hearts, and your word tells us that each one of us must pass that way, dear Lord. So we pray that you would have the mercy on Miss Miriam Tatum, who is the deceased, Father God, but we also pray for their family who is left behind, that you would comfort them, dear Lord, that you would let them know that all is well, Father God, as I understood from the service yesterday, that she is your servant, that she served well in your church, Father God, and they spoke well of her saying that they believe that she did all that you called her to do. So we thank you for the life that you had given her, Father God, and the time that she shared with her family. And we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would comfort them. We wait expectantly, Father God, on healing and praise reports for the sick, dear Lord, and we thank you for the comfort that you provide to the family even now. It is in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The tithes and offerings, as Sister April said, we thank you very much for all the giving that you hit, get, do at this local assembly. And we just want to be able to lift these up to God in prayer right now. So if you will bow your heads, we will pray over the tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. Thank you, dear Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, dear Lord. And we thank you for the provisions that you give for us, dear Lord. We know that you created this world and everything in it is yours and that you do not need anything from us. But your word does command us to give back to you the first fruits of our increase, dear Lord. And it also tells us not to do so grudgingly or out of necessity, but with happy hearts. So as we give back into your kingdom, dear Lord, let us be happy. Father God, to give back a percentage of what you have given to us, dear Lord, for us to be able to care for ourselves and our families while we are here on this earth, and that the portion that we give back into your kingdom, dear Lord, will go out to do all that you called it to do, as we know that your word does not return void. We thank you for each and every person that gave at this local assembly, dear Lord, and we thank you for those that, <clears throat> excuse me, had the desire to do so, but were unable to. We pray, Father God, that you continue to press upon their hearts, that you are the Lord of this world, and that you own everything. Father God, and that you would not ask us to do anything that you would not provide for us so that when we get ready to give what you have asked us to give, we will not do so fearfully, dear Lord, but knowing, Father God, that you have asked us to do so and that you would care for us in every area of our life. We thank you, Father God, for all that you have done. We pray that these offerings will be a sweet smelling aroma in your nostrils, and it is in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now we will move into the devotional moment, which um, these devotionals are written by Pastor White. You can get the full year devotional from January 1 to December 31st in the media ministry. And it's just a small donation to put the book together. If you don't have that, then you can um, just let them know and they still will provide the book to you. Bless you. Um, and um, it also comes in a three month devotional. Right now we're in January, February and March. And you can get those. I believe they are on the information table and there are some outside in the lobby 
Lobby and they are free of charge. So pick them up, keep them handy, keep them around, read them, share them um, because I, I do find that they are very, very helpful to me as I try to know more about Jesus and what it is that he expects from me in this life. So um, the devotional that I chose for today um, was from January the 27th, but as I was just sitting there um, getting ready to come up, I feel like the Lord pressed upon my heart to share two devotionals with you today, and they're very quick. So I'll, I'll um, read the one that's from Thursday, January the 27th, and it's entitled Real Life. And the scripture reads, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In this scripture, we are admonished to give thought to how we live. Unbelievers live out their lives based upon their own philosophy of mind. God says this is vanity. Vanity is futility. God declares that unbelievers live out a futile existence that cannot lead to life, but actually alienates, alienates them from the life of God. This should serve as a warning to all believers. We must pursue a mind fixed on the word of God. Only in the word do we find real life that brings blessings. And the other one I felt like the Lord wanted me to share was from today, January the 29th, and it's entitled, Live Among the Wise. The scripture reads, the ear that he here, the reproof of life abide among the wise. Proverbs 15, 31. Many times Jesus, the Lord Jesus would say, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. This saying does not mean a person with the ability to simply hear sound. If, they've, if this were the case, then all but those who were deaf could comply with his command. This saying deals with the ability to discern and follow the wisdom and warnings of the spirit of God that surround us. In one place, the Lord Jesus talked about the weather and how people were able to know what season was coming by looking at the sky. Likewise, God declares to us to be able to discern the time and the seasons by being observant and having ears to ear hear and eye ears to hear and eyes to see. This proverb tells us that the person who truly hears God's wisdom concerning life abides or lives with wise people. This is because once a person becomes comes to understand that much of the pain and sorrow they experience is only the result of not following God's wisdom in their life, they quickly surround themselves with only those who follow God's way. It is one thing to experience sorrow that is not of our making, but there is no reward for bearing the pain of unwise decisions. Hear the words of God's wisdom for this life and live among the wise. And so, um, you know, I was originally going to do the first one just about uh, futility and vain living and vain thoughts and all that. And then just like I said, as I was sitting there, I felt like God wanted me to share this one as well, because I wanted to share an experience with you that kind of ties into what Pastor White was talking about in Bible study on Thursday. So in Bible study, he was talking about we should avoid people where God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame and whose mind is on earthly things. And so I was um, at a gas station one day and I was getting ready to purchase some things. I was in line waiting and this gentleman came up and the line was pretty long and it was going pretty slow. So he kind of struck up a conversation. And so he just kind of started talking about Jesus. And I'm like, OK, I, I can have a conversation with anybody that wants to talk about Jesus. So he's telling me, you know, all of these things about God and what he's done for him in his life and all this stuff. And I'm like, great. And so he asked me where I go to church and I told him, and I, you know, um, and we just had conversations. And so as we were getting ready to leave out, he kind of stopped me again and he kind of picked up the conversation again, but he kind of turned a little bit. And so um, he started telling me, you know, he started he first gave me a card and um, on the card. And I'm not sure if it was from his church, but it had his church's name on it. It had his name on it. And on the back of it, it had Habakkuk 2, 2. And that scripture reads, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that read it. And so, you know, if, if, you know, you've been listening to the sermons that's been going on around here. Pastor has mentioned that a couple of times. But when he's talking to me about the scripture, he starts to say, you know, um, the reason why you don't have what you want in life. Now, where he got that from, I don't know, because we had never talked about that. But he told me the reason why I don't have what I want in life is because I have not written down my vision and made it plain for my angels. And I'm like, whoa, what is happening here? Like, we just, this is just went totally to the left. And he was like, your angels are waiting for you to write down everything that you want out of this life so that they can go and they can move on that and they can give you what it is that you're asking for. And immediately I was like, it was like a red flag, like, nah, 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 like get out of here because 
there's nowhere in the first of all that scripture doesn't even mean that you know what i'm saying like they it was about to be some terror that was going on during this time and god was like write, write it down so everybody can read it and they can understand what's about to happen that's what i learned here right and so um even in what it says in the bible but it's in explaining and being able to grow and learn here and so i'm like that's not even what that means and then second of all there's nowhere in the bible that says you're supposed to talk to angels and ask them to do anything to you for you because they don't move at your command angels are created beings that move at God's command. And so, you know, as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking these things, I'm like, I, you know, the only thing that, and, and I really kind of had blocked him out because my mind, like the Holy Ghost just really brought all of this stuff to my mind. And I'm like, the only time that people talk to angels in the Bible is when God had them appear, but they appeared as men. And also the Bible says, be careful how you entertain strangers because you may be entertaining angels unawares. And so all of this stuff is going through my mind as he's talking to me and I'm just like, Lord, thank you very much for the church that you have given me because I can surround myself with wise people. And I'm telling you guys, this place is good ground and fertile soil. We can come here. We get the word. Our pastor stays in the word. He spends time with God. He's a good teacher to be able to give it to us. We have the ability to come here and pray on Wednesdays, get before our knees on God. We have the ability to study the word on Thursdays with our pastor and by ourselves. So I just felt like those two things God wanted me to share. Don't walk in the vanity of your mind making stuff up like you need to write stuff down for angels because that's not how this, you're going to be living a vain existence. And also to surround yourself with wise people so that when you hear these things, the Holy Spirit can say to you, no, 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 run as far away from that as you can. Because even if I did not have a home church, I would not have been visiting that church. I hope something that I have said will help you today. At this time, we will have the, the message with Pastor White. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Church of the angels. Uh, maybe that's what that is. Pra Praise the Lord. Good to see all y'all this morning and good again to be in the house of God with you all. All right. And I want to say good morning to our online audience. Um, as we get ready to see it, I feel like I should be deliberate this morning since everybody pressed out like they did with their boats and whatever else I'm sure you needed to do this with and I do really appreciate it. So let's um, see if we can do our Bible confession and see, I believe this word is tied to just for the day. This is just a great day for, for what it is that I have here in this message. So here we go. Today I will believe and confess that Jesus Christ was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Praise the Lord. All right. I think I must have left my... Uh, just so you know, Sister Laura, I must have been putting my lotion on. I don't know when I just realized I didn't have my ring on. I didn't want to throw my hand up and you notice it or something, but uh, that's what happened. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, let, let's, um, I, I want to say this. Our chairs are in the warehouse, and so they've given us, they said, probably anywhere to 15 to 20 days. They should be shipped and here, so we're probably looking at sometime in February. Uh, we'll have the chairs in and probably won't be, maybe around the beginning of March, I'd be something like that. We'll probably have everything, pews out, chairs down and everything. I don't want to be too aggressive in my timing, but that's what they told us that probably around mid-February, we should have the chairs. Once they're delivered, then we'll do what we have to do to take care of everything. And then we'll be moving on to the next thing. So I just want to let you all know that. Um, all right. Okay. Today, I think is a really good day uh, to deal with the message that I want to deal with. We're going to go to first, we're going to look at Luke chapter two, Luke chapter two. And we're going to read verse 40 through 49, Luke chapter two, verse 40 through 49. All right. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. 
Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard them, him, were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us this way? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Matthew chapter 13. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 37 through 50. Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 through 50, we'll read. All right, here we go. <clears throat> he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the man, son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into sea and gathered every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Last place I want to go is the book of Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter six. And we're going to read verse one through eight. Acts chapter six, verse one through eight. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of holy, the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicador, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, today in the name of Jesus, we thank you again for the opportunity to come into your house. I pray and ask today, let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. And Father, today, let the day's events and all that happened add meaning to your word in such a way that it will help us to recognize what we need to do in our lives. We ask it even now in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Today, especially with all of the, you know, anybody that's out of the country that watches this or somewhere else wouldn't know, but with all the rain and everything, um, you know, it's a lot of rain going on, a lot of weather. And so some people are here, some are not, et cetera. There's going to be, at least in my mind, there would be probably two types of people, let's say for today. There would be those who could not come. They're flooded in. There's some way they can't, just can't press in and get here. 
You know, I had one call from one of our staff people. That was the case. Flooded in. They said they were flooded in. Can't get out. Then uh, someone else who was out was just already out. They weren't here today anyway. But other than that, the entire staff is here. Everybody that's supposed to be here is here. They're all here and doing what they do. And then there are you all who are here, right, who could have been chose, could not have come. Obviously, you were able to because you're here. So then those who are not here are divided either into one of two categories. Those who chose not to come because they couldn't, or those who chose not to come for other reasons. Either they just chose not to come. Why go out in all this rain? Or could have chose not to come because maybe the future, maybe they know their street will flood or something's going to happen. And they just, because of all of that, they just decided not to come. And then those who just decided not to come, right? But that's up to them to figure out what category they would fit in. I remember when I was a manager at McDonald's, there was never, ever a day that I could call in and tell them I was shutting my store down because it was raining. Literally, my field supervisor came out one time and the electricity had gone off. We ran McDonald's because everything was running was on gas. So we had the doors open. You couldn't come inside. We wouldn't let you in. But drive through, we did it. People say, how'd you do drive through? Just drive through. In other words, we had people drive around to the window. They would place their order at the window because the point is, what's the difference? I mean, why wait at the thing? You know, so you come around to the window, we take your order, do our thing. And all the adding was done on paper because the machines wouldn't work. Right. So you just did addition. We took the cash, put it in a box and just kept rolling, cooking on the gas grill and frying fries and getting the drinks. Right. Well, it was business, though. So it was business. I'm sure right now if we go to Walmart, I was joking around with somebody this morning. There may not be no customers there, but I bet you that little Walmart star lit up. And as soon as the rain stops, and some people at Walmart right now, I know they are. I know they there. I know you know y'all know they there, right? Now, this is not to indict anyone. This is, this is just perfect ground. When God gave me this message, none of this was going on. My title of my message today is Too Busy for Business. Too busy for business. And my thesis is that there are many people who are too busy for the business that really matters to God. Now, what made me come up with this topic was I've called, I've got all this kind of different things going on in my life where I need assistance from these people who say they're in business. And it's amazing you call them and they're too busy to do the business they in. Or you give them something to do and you call and trying to follow up and they're not doing it because they busy. Man, I don't want to hear you busy. If you sold me something on a schedule of what you were going to do, I'm not interested in hearing you busy. You got a business to handle. And so what ends up happening is you end up turning it over to somebody bigger, basically, is all that ends up happening. You know, the people who are going to come out, take care of business. They may charge more, but when it's all over, that's what happens. So you could be stuck in a place that if you're not careful, you're too busy for business. And, 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 it, and, and all of a sudden, as I was thinking about it, I, I sensed God was like, this is the problem with the church. Not necessarily this church. This is the problem with church, with people, with God's people. They are too busy for the business that matters to God. Now, I read to you in the book of Luke where you see when Jesus is going to Jerusalem and at 12, his parents, which, you know, I'm not going to say they was irresponsible, but, you know, they did leave off thinking the boy was with everybody else. I called him the boy at that time. He was Jesus. They thought Jesus with the rest of their family. Now, I wouldn't do that. If I went to a family reunion and all my family was there and we would leave, and I wouldn't just assume my kid was in the car with my people. I would check to make sure I had my kids. But I'm not going to, you know, hate on Mary and, and, and Joseph. Maybe they was busy. But the point is that they left and went several days before they realized Jesus wasn't with them. So they circle back around and they go back and find Jesus in the temple talking to the elders and listening and all. And, and they say, son, why did you do this to us? And Jesus' response wasn't, oh, I'm sorry. Jesus said, why wouldn't y'all know I'd have to be about my father's business? So early, early, early in the age of this young 
child, he recognizes that his father had business that needed to be handled. You know, he may have his own ideas. He may have his own, just like Sister Miranda said this morning, whoever this is with this card and flipping over, you know why you don't have the things in life. And when you've read what the angels are going to be doing, at the end of the world, the angels are going to be gathering up the wicked, God says, and casting them into flames of fire. They are not running around gathering up your riches and things you want out of this life. That is not even so, according to the word of God. What the Jesus said they will be doing is when the end of the world comes, the wicked and, and he asked the question, how did these wicked end up in the kingdom? He said the devil did that. He sold them in. Even in churches, you have some that are really just not even God. It's the devil. And the question is, how did the devil get in the church? He came. He showed up. You know, there's no sign on don't say the devil can't attend. So he shows up. And what happens? He comes to church. He attends for whatever his reasons are. I've had a few attend because they're looking for a woman. And eventually they get them and then they leave. But there are reasons that this happens. Right. And so with all of this going on, all of this happening, you find yourself saying, do people recognize and can they distinguish their business from God's? You know, in other words, the way the church lives today. That's what, what, what Miranda was basically pointing out, whether we understood it or not. And what this man, what they're really saying is somehow God's business is your business. The fact that you're trying to prosper in the world and all this. I have to talk like a preacher. I was going to say crap. But I didn't preach it. You see, I said I was going to say crap. All of this stuff that you got yourself occupied with, that you think God cares about, you think that's God's business. People think God, God's in the blessing business. Oh, my goodness. And not understanding that God had already laid it out plain. Jesus, I, I don't know why and when it happened for me. It just started clicking that the Lord was like, do you really, this was my sense, do you really read what I said? Do you like read it and accept it as what I was saying? Or do you just read? See, a lot of times we just read and we don't realize this is what Jesus said. This is why I said that either this man is absolutely crazy or we need to be figuring out what God's business is. He said, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sold him is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. And therefore, the tares are gathered and buried in the fire, burned in the fire. So it's going to be in the end of the world. The son of man is going to send his angels out. They're going to gather out of his kingdom everything that offends and does iniquity and going to cast it into a furnace of fire. Now, some people believe that, well, because they go to church or they whatever, that that that, you know, that means they not them people. And the, and the Bible has already made it plain. That's not true. There are some who are in church, some claiming to be Christians, all of this, who are just not saved. They don't know God and they're caught up in the vanity of their minds. And God says, Paul said it on Wednesday when we were looking at Philippians. He says, I weep for these people. He said their God is their belly. And, the, and that term belly means I'm always desiring. What, is, what am I going to do? What can God give me? What is God going to do for me? Oh, God bless me. Every single thing I'm doing is pursuing after something that's just mine, mine. That's all I care about is mine. And Jesus makes it plain. These people are going to be gathered up, he says, and cast into a flame of fire. Then he goes on to talk about, he says, what the kingdom is like. He says again in verse 44, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure that's hid in a field, the which when a man finds it, he hides it. And for joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearl. He has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So he's saying, People don't get it. Death is real, no matter how long we live. You can live 200 years, you're going to die. This morning, as I was thinking about Methuselah, I thought to myself, what does anybody do for 900 and some years? 
it would seem to me after a while, even if you like living, it would get pretty boring after 900 years. That's how long the man lived. Noah and all these people were living hundreds of years. What do you do for hundreds of years? You know what I'm saying? People are like, I just want to live long. Well, I mean, what are you going to be doing? All your friends going to die unless they live to be that way. And then your friends die, this die. Well, you're just living, right? Well, you know, there's something more to be said about life. God has put you here, not put you here. You're here. You now have found God, hopefully, as Paul said, I hope I have. And now God says, let me tell you what life is really about. What life really was about is not that I put you here and gave you a purpose and trying to figure out how to bless your life all the time. You were born as a sinner. My parents, some of your parents chose to have babies. Others didn't. It just kind of happened that way. And when it's over, you're here now. But now you're saved. And now that you're saved, I want you to know what really happened. I created the earth. It was basically then corrupted and all mankind fell into sin. And because of that, they need a, re a redeemer. They needed a savior because other than that, men are separated from me. Some of the righteous would go to paradise, but the wicked went straight to hell. And that's what the condition was. So I saved you all. Then when I saved you, I now told you, get on the right path and live out the life you have now, whatever that life may be. If you turn out to be a slave, don't worry about it. You're my free person. If you're in free, don't think you're free because you're my slave. You have to realize that whatever can find you in, stay in it and deal with it and know that what? I love you and I care about you. Stop trying to figure out how you got here, why it's like this. Uh, don't worry about that. Worry about serving me acceptably Find out what my business is, because when it's over, you're going to die. Rich, young, master, slave. Every one of the slave owners from the time of slavery is dead. Many of them are probably in hell. And a lot of the slaves are probably in heaven, but some of them probably in hell. Bottom line is they all dead. Though. Life went on by and now we all running around talking about what we think that means for us. But the reality is they're all dead and gone. What does it mean? What does it mean? What do I have to do? Can I distinguish my business from God's? Do I recognize God has business? See, Jesus, his parents would have preferred he had gotten in the caravan and gone on with them. Jesus is like, look, man, I need to be about my father's business. But it wasn't going out and doing something. It was being in the temple, learning of God and listening and hearing and growing in grace, the Bible says. That's what he understood was the business of God. Some people can't distinguish the business. You see, I think that this is what creates the phenomena today. Because those who choose to say, well, I'm just not going to go, e even though you could. You know, Brother Lynch and them came all the way from Prairie View. Uh, uh, Brother Chapman and them come all the way from Baker. Some of y'all are coming from other places. I mean, y'all coming from long places. So, you know, you could have said, you, you, and it would have sounded good, huh? Prairie View. If you would have come and said, Pastor, not Prairie View, it's a long way. I, 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 a lot of stuff. I'd have said, Brother, I understand. I would have understood that, right? But they're sitting there. You know, people could, people make choices. The bottom line is that I will never, you ain't never going to catch me. Even if the lights went out, this would be the right time for it, huh? <laughs> They'd be like, okay, Lord, I got you. But even if the lights are out, I remember working for people. Them people had us working. When I worked at Exxon, you went to work. It didn't matter what was going on. They had generators to back stuff up. And if they didn't have a generator backing it up, you were standing guard over it to make sure nobody jumped over that fence. But the bottom line was we went to work. We went. Them people expected us to be there. Now, some people say that they are unreasonable. Oh, whatever. I'm just telling you, when it comes to business, oh, people about business now. Oh, they're going to be about that business. You wait and see. Leave out of here and want to go eat after church. I bet you find somebody old willing to feed you. They'll swim out in that parking lot if they have to to bring you a meal because they're trying to make sure they get paid. They got to keep that restaurant open. Them people can't be closing and, and, and you know, every other day because it's raining or it's the storm coming and all that. Only state workers talk like that. Y'all know that. We get paid no matter what, right? It's raining, let's stay home. It's snowing, let's stay home. And it's snowing, oh, well, we'll make so We don't know. Look, whatever, that, we don't need to go today. Did you hear the governor call? Made it a holiday. Okay. 
Now, I'm not getting down on being protecting yourself. See, some people want to make me look see you don't know. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that you know there are some things that you ain't going to miss. Now, I don't know what that is for you, but there's some stuff that I tell you what, you will swim out and get it done if you got to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to make your way. You're going to push out. You're going to do whatever. The, the Lord going to literally have to shut it down for you not to get there. There's some people that's, not this church, I ain't, about, I ain't about to say what I say. There's some people that's meeting up this month. <laughs> and they don't care what's going on. They're going to meet up. They're going to swim there, boat there, going to do whatever they got to do. To get where they're trying to go. People go through all kinds of things to get where they got to go, to where they want to be. And God is trying, Jesus done said this. Jesus said, why don't y'all understand this? Look, look, he, the, the, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus describes the kingdom's value. And, 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 and he talks first about the wicked and the righteous. So we understand that they are wicked and they're righteous. We got them both ways. Wicked and the righteous. Now, hopefully we are in the righteous group. But there's some, for whatever their reasons are, that are not. But if we are, he starts explaining to us what ought to be happening. And only you know if this is what goes on with you. Look at what he says. The righteous recognize something. First of all, they recognize what they have. He says, look, look, look in verse 44. Like, like Miranda said in verse 43, Jesus said, who have ears to hear, let him hear. You got some ears on your head. That ain't what we talking about. Spiritual ears. You better listen. Now God is talking. He says, you got ears? Listen. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus is telling you what the kingdom of heaven is like. Why? People always keep saying, I wish I knew what heaven was like. I wish I knew. Well, here it is. That's why I said either you don't believe Jesus or you just read. If you believe Jesus, which you should if you're a Christian, then here is what heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like. He says it's like this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found it, he hides it, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So Jesus is saying, let me make y'all understand whether you getting this or not, because the righteous understand the value of the kingdom's business. He says that the kingdom is like this when people fully recognize it. It's just like a person who basically finds a treasure in a field somewhere. They know about it. It's like buying a house. You recognize something about that house that the people selling it obviously don't. And for you to take advantage of it is not a problem. And basically... You, you, you don't care what the price is. You go sell every single thing you got to buy that field. He said another is like a person who's in the pearl business. He finds a pearl that is of great price. He goes and sells every single thing he has so he can buy that pearl. Now, what don't people understand about this? See, many people are going to get before Jesus and hopefully they saved because this is what Paul said. We'll be, I mean, Peter will be saved as by fire. He says, some of us, our work going to get burned up, Paul say, but at least we'll be saved. But ain't nothing we going to have done going to last. That's just a shame. That's just a shame. I don't want to go before God and he say to me, you know, all that preaching you were doing. That's why I say all the time. Look, love, you don't want me, you just shut it down, please. Help me to understand that I shouldn't be doing it. Shut me down. Let me go do something else. Show me what to do because I don't want to waste my time. Not here this morning because I just need somewhere to talk. Now, I was doing that at a school. I can talk all day long. They give you classes full of students. They'll stuff them out running all out the back door if they can. You can talk to them all day. Well, not all day, but you know, for your class, right? So 
Why are you doing this, Pastor? <laughs> because Jesus said, if you really understand certain things, you take your life, you trade that in, and you purchase what you know is of great price. If I had, if I played the lotto, which you don't, and I knew that the ticket you were giving me was worth a billion dollars, let's say. You don't know it, but I'm not responsible to tell you, you know, whatever. Now, we might get into later some other issues you might legally be able to talk about, but forget those right now. And you sell a ticket to me for a dollar. And I buy the ticket from you. Well, would I go and give you $500,000? Absolutely. Now, you might wonder why I would do such a thing, but if it's worth a billion, well, then that pretty good deal. Even if all I had was 500000 I'm going to go sell everything I got so I can buy this ticket. Ain't no sense of me making up examples. Jesus already gave them to you. The treasure, the pearl. This is what he's saying. So when we get to heaven and God says, please explain to me why you wasted your whole life doing that. Why did you not see any value in pursuing things that I put in front of you to pursue? What things you might say to God, right? I don't know. Only you would know, right? But one thing today I know for sure, you should be sitting in that seat unless you can't or something happened. I mean, now if it's different now if you just can't be. I get that. We ain't talking about, you know, you know, I'm talking about on an ongoing, consistent basis and then choosing on a day because of some adversity that doesn't stop you from other things. All right, in other words, the things that happen. But the point I'm making is that if this adversity of today would not stop you from other things, then how can it stop you from this thing? You know, only you gotta know that. I, I, I don't care about this right now. I'm trying to make it clear though, when you leave this place and go do what you do, how much of your life, if you were to look at it, would you say, I actually can't recognize the difference between my business and God's business? The distinction. I know the distinction and I spend, I know I'm pursuing God's business like Jesus did, right? That's why the Bible says Jesus made himself of no reputation. I mean, the boy understood at some point he was the son of God. But instead of him pursuing being a king or pursuing trying to do it a way where people would listen to him, he purposely chose to stay a carpenter. He purposely chose to humble himself. He purposely chose to do it that way, make himself of no reputation and be a servant. That was his choice because he had to be about his father's business. He didn't have time to be tied up with all this other stuff. I got ministry to do, he says, right? His father's business. Does this mean it? No, yo, whatever you may be doing. I mean, only you know, only you know, though, I'm saying. You have to be asking yourself, do I know the difference? Am I valuing the kingdom's business? And then am I willing to make a decision to handle the father's business? See, see, this idea of going and selling, it's one thing to say, ooh, we, that's a pretty treasure. It's another thing to go sell everything you have and pursue that treasure and buy it. See, it's one thing to say, oh, that's really nice. We should study the word of God. Very nice. We ought to pray. But we need to do it. You know, we got to reach a place we understand the business of God is so important enough that we begin to say, you know what? I'm going to make a decision. And that's what happens here. They make a decision. It's like this is the decision I make. I'm going to go buy this field. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going buy it. I got to do this. This is what happened to me. Now, I don't know about y'all, what you're doing in your life and how you're doing it. But this is what happened to me. There came a moment I had to make a decision. I had to. It's like I got, I got to make a decision. I mean, the people, the guy, that, they, they done split my job up in about six or seven people now. And, and, and all of them make $200,000 a year. All, every one of them. Six people. That ought to tell you what my job was worth. I had to make a decision, though. Lord, I'm getting older. I don't have so much time. And I believe you called me to this church. I must put my time, because I was putting so much time into that job. 
and so much time in there. I was still doing what I had to do over here, but at the same time, I didn't feel I was putting in all of what I could to learn, to understand, to go deeper, to do what must be done. So no matter what happens, I could stand before Jesus and say, Lord, I did everything I could try to do. I gave myself fully to it. The results speak for whatever they are. I can, I, I'm not the results maker. You the one to do that. I, all I could do is put forth my effort. So I left my job and I came to do what I'm doing. And that's why, because what? I recognize the value of the field. I recognize the value of the pearl. I see it. And I know that Jesus is not a liar. And so my expectation is that all, I will get there and hopefully he will say, white, well done. White, I appreciate the fact that you were willing to walk away. White, I appreciate the fact that you saw the value in getting before me and spending the time you were spending doing this other stuff because it was a lot of time. Make a decision to handle the father's business. At some point, this is what these people did. They bought the field. In the book of Acts, we looked at those verses and the apostles recognized that they had a role in the father's business. It's kind of interesting. You know, many churches you'll go to and or sometimes you'll hear these people preaching and they say some of the most interesting things. And in the book of Acts, chapter six, you know, they'll say things, you know, like, well, we need a church like they had back in the first century. We need the old church and you know, all this stuff they be saying. But in Acts, chapter six, you see they had problems like everybody. In the very first verse, it says, Acts 6, 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples, that's church members, was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So let's stop there. So in other words, it makes no sense for us to believe that, oh, we, if our church keeps growing and growing and growing, it's going to be perfect. That you're not going to have people who are going to be doing stuff they ain't got no business doing. People not handling things the way they should, people doing things ugly with other people. That's not going to happen. Here we are in the church. This is the first century church. These people really got the Holy Ghost. You know how they say that. How they really had it. We know this for a fact. The apostles were still there. All right, working miracles, real ones. Not like that stuff we're doing today. Real miracles they're working. And look what happens. The Grecians, that's the Greeks, the people that were not Jews, were murmuring because the Jewish widows were getting more than they were getting. Now, this don't say they thought they were. Uh-uh. The scripture is clear. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected. So you walked up and you served the Jewish widows and gave them portions and did whatever. And then the Greeks, the non-Jewish widows, you didn't treat the same. In the church with apostles. <laughs> so I am not concerned about the fact that something like that could go on up here. People not treating somebody fair, they're not doing whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is what do you do about it? This is God's business. See, this was part of God's business. God, these people needed help. These, there were widows. They didn't have their husbands. All kind of things were going on. And so the church was charged with taking care of them. That's part of God's business. So what happens? It says in verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. All right. Now, in other words, the apostles recognized their role in the father's business. There was no reason for them to get distracted from their role in the business. Now, some people could say, well, see, here's the problem. Everybody want to be important. They don't want to serve tables. Well, we know this is not the case because Jesus made it plain to them when he took the towel off and wrapped himself and said, you know, you all are servants of the people. He that wants to be the greatest must be the servant. But this is not because they don't want to wait on tables. The point is, they say, it is not reason. We don't even see a reason that we need to leave what we're doing, which is what? The word of God, ministering it so we can wait on some tables. Because you people won't act like Christians. Because that's really what's going on. If you have some, let, 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 we could use, let's use races today instead of this. That'll make it easier. White people and black people. You go into church and the black people getting served and the white people not, or vice versa. Point was, 
You're making distinctions based on race. That's what they were doing here. It's going on in the church, right? Well, that ain't how Christians are supposed to act. But the apostles say, man, that ain't no reason for us to leave what we're doing to come make sure the people get treated fair. That'd be like somebody telling me, well, pastor, every time I come in, they make me sit at the back. And every time they would come in, they let them sit at the front. And, and I, well, okay, what you want me to come to the door? <laughs> pastor at the door, every Sunday, well, who gonna preach? Well, I guess I'll get to it. Maybe I'll preach from the door. Praise the Lord, y'all. Look, hold on one second. Look, I'm over here. Come over here. See, I, I, what am I, it is not reason that I should leave to have to do that. He says, no, 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 no. They recognize their role. Do you recognize yours? Do you have one? Maybe your role is just to attend sometimes for people. That's all it is, just attend. But at the same time, things will begin to present themselves that people need to be asking themselves, well, you know what, let me ask myself the question. When I leave here, what exactly am I doing that I would classify as the father's business? I'm just asking. I ain't trying to put no pressure on nobody. I want you to just think. When I leave, what is it that I'm doing? It could be very well that the very thing you do, that's what it is. You may have your own homeless shelter you open and you out there handling the homeless or whatever you're doing. But what I'm saying is if I'm in the business of business to make money and that's what I'm doing, then I would be very careful saying I'm just doing that for God. I need to be careful with that only because why? That, 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 I don't know about that one because Jesus was the one who kept saying every time he ran into somebody, the fishermen and the others, and he said to, to them, leave your business basically. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they were in the fishing business. And Peter told Jesus, he says, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, nobody has left all these things he listed and said, we'll not receive even more in this life and the life to come. He wasn't saying you leave your business, you're going to get a hundred businesses. That wasn't his point. But his point was that what? By gaining the abundant life that you gain in Christ. You will get what it is that it is that you need. I mean, the things that God can multiply, God can make it happen in a way that you don't. My wife called me this morning. I think it was like 830. Something at the house needed to be done because of the rain. My, I got in my car from left from here, went all the way back to my house, did what I had to do in the rain, put my clothes back on, come all the way back to church. And I made it. You know, so I'm like, well, I got to come down the airline. Well, so did I twice this morning. You know what I mean? I mean, all I'm saying, y'all, it's really about, you may say, well, that's because you're the pastor. Right, yeah. I get it. I mean, I don't know why. They just, pastor, man, you know, a big P on your chest, and it makes you, you know, able to accomplish great things. You know, you can leap buildings and, and run through rain, and I don't know what that's about. No, you just got to get up and go do it. You know, I left this morning early enough to get here, so by the time she called, well, okay, that was out of the way. Let me go and come on back. But the reality is, well, I had to do something or I could be up here wondering about what's happening back there. Now, let me just go and try to take care of this and get it done because God will give you the time you need as long as you don't get distracted from your role in the business. What is your role in the business? What is your role in the business? A father's business, not just church. You see, I ain't say church. I said the father's business. Stephen got stoned outside of church. I mean, he, people started disputing with Stephen about what he knew because, and I want you to see this, not only was, before, wait till I get there. This, this is what the apostles did. <clears throat> they delegated tasks to willing and qualified people. Now, now, let me put some emphasis on that then. Qualified. Now, I ain't talking about qualified like, you know, you got degrees and all that other kind of stuff because the Bible says when he tells them to pick the people, look at what it says in verse three. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report. First thing, don't get me no liars and thieves and foolishness. If you're known for shenanigans and craziness, then you don't need to be one of them they was trying to pick. That's what they say. This is why I don't get it. Why people don't understand that what you do outside matters. You know, if everybody that I know, every time I mention your name, and there's some people you can mention my name to, they'll just throw it all up under the bus. But I would suggest to you, check on why. 
Yeah, that's all I'm asking. Just, you know, just, just go a little deeper and see if you can find out their relationship to me before you judge. That's all I would ask you to do. But if everybody you meet and you say my name throws me under the bus, then maybe there's something to being up under the bus. And I got to know that. So I can't just set you into doing something, choosing you, delegate something to you because I just think you good at it. The Bible says plainly, choose out from among you seven men of honest report. What we need to hear is good stuff, an honest report that's being said. People get upset. There have been times I've asked people, they come here, they want to do something. I said, well, can you tell me where you came from? They won't get upset. Well, I don't think that's important. Okay, well, I'm just trying to understand. You would think you won't give me that. Because when I call them, they're going to say, oh, yes, that's somebody we wish had never left. We got people like that who we have found ourselves saying, you know, well, Sister Serena's up in St. Louis, and it's, that's how it is. You're like, oh, man, we wish if somebody calls me that she had never left. And others. And then there's some people may call me and they say, well, what do you know? I say, hey, I'm glad they left. And they would be like, so what should we be doing? Look, that is not my business. I'm going to stay out of that. But I'm not giving you no recommendations. OK, I'm not doing it. And that all that speaks for itself. You want to know who is serving among you. Paul said it all the time. Who is this that is laboring amongst us? We should know and we should understand that. And that's then who we're looking and saying, OK, let's find somebody we can delegate. He says, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. You know, you can't operate out of just your own mind. You have to have God's wisdom. You have to have God's spirit. You can't just, it's like with them children back there. Them children. I, you know, sometimes I listen to myself. And I say, these people, I think, that's some, that man, some ignorant at time. He say he got a degree. Why he talk like that? Okay. Those children. <laughs> you can't just put no anybody back there now. And all of a sudden, the parents come out, and they're telling them something crazy. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Where'd you get that? Oh, that's what the teacher said in uh, the academy. They'd be like, okay, well, you know what? You just come sit up here with me. Because I ain't so sure what that's about. Like Sister Miranda said, you know, you, you can't have people running roughshod and coming up with their own ideas and their own stuff. Well, I know that they don't teach that in there. Meaning right here now, you know, they're over there. They don't teach that in there, but right in here. That ain't what we're doing. They got to be people who are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom because the Spirit of God is one. He ain't going to be all, all like this. You come through the front door and it's purple. You go through the back door and it's green. That ain't what's happening. It's purple all the way through, or green all the way through, or blue all the way through. It's consistent. And he says, get, that's how God is. God's going to deal with everybody the same. Now, that doesn't mean that if I don't have the ability to do something, that God's going to say, okay, just go do it. I think I've joked around in here with y'all before. That's why I said, well, I was looking for a musician. I had a pastor tell me, I said, do you know anybody new musicians? He said, not none you want to know. See, that's what I mean. He was like, look, I had a lot of them, and I know where they at right now, but I, you don't want to know them. Well, that was all it took for me. I, 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 I wouldn't care if we just bang on the nothing. Then to take somebody that already has, I done got a bad report and set them there to do something and then start, when, they, when it all start, whatever it is that I ain't been told about, now I got to deal with it. He said, no, 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 no. You have to do what? Delegate these tasks, though. See, you have to know if you're out there now, let's say you have a business. And you're out there and you believe whatever you're doing even may, is what God wants you to be doing because we all have to have uh, vocations. You, know, you can't just sit around doing nothing. Now, the Bible says that, you know, we should work. So let's say you have some business or something you're doing and, and you're trying to figure out what to do with it. Well, you definitely need to make sure if you're delegating tasks, you're delegating it to not only people that are 
able to do something, but also people who are qualified, in my sense, would be in God's way of looking at things. And especially in here, you have to do that because people have to have wisdom and they have to be using God's spirit. You know, there must be a way for us to understand how this has to work. And then, although Stephen, this is what I want you to find is so interesting to me. Even though Stephen was serving tables, the Bible says in verse eight, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So the Bible says that this started with a problem with the widows not being served right. And then they bring it to the apostles and the apostles say, look, it's not meat or reason for us to leave the word that we're working on to go handle this business. You all choose out from among you seven people full of the Holy Spirit and power and wisdom and put them over this business. So while they were serving tables, that was Stephen's job. Somewhere, God, in recognizing whatever Stephen took on, also anointed Stephen in such a way that he was able to do wonders and miracles. The Bible says that Stephen was full of faith and power in such a way that even though his job was not apostle, his job was not pastor, his job was not any of that, he was a deacon serving tables that the spirit of God fell on him in such a way that he had such power. He was the first martyr of the church. He wasn't even an apostle. Stephen, Stephen was preaching and going back and forth with these people. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was speaking to him with such authority that the people were cut and they drug him out and they began to stone Stephen. Before Stephen, they did that, Stephen said, I see Jesus. The son of man standing on the right hand of God. The Bible said Jesus. Now, the Bible says Jesus sat down on the right hand of the father when he went up there. Now, But the Bible says, Stephen says, I see Jesus standing. So the question is, is this just something the Bible says or was it really like, you know, I remember one time when I would preach with these people and, and, and we would go to these different evangelist meetings. And when you'd be preaching, you know, especially if you got into the flow of something, you'd hear one of them stand up and say, stand tall. And what they meant was you might be the people might be getting upset and you might be popping some of them and they looking crazy. But stand tall because God is speaking right now. And guess what? They might be mad, but as long as God is on you, you're good. Keep going. And, and so they were trying to encourage you. Well, that's what I think might have happened here. You know, Stephen is out there going, and he's got a whole crowd against him. And the Holy Spirit is flowing. Stephen is hitting him. And all of a sudden, they're about to kill this man. And instead of him going, oh, my God, I don't want to die, Stephen says, "Be I see Jesus, basically, the son of man, standing on the right hand of God. And that's when they began stoning him. And the Bible says that the last thing out of Stephen's mouth was, don't lay this sin to their charge. Wow. That's the kind of power and authority. But he was just a deacon. See, so when you say just, point is, the position didn't matter when God began using this man. See, see, God can begin to use people in different ways, in different places, depending on what they're doing. And a lot of times what happens because people don't recognize God's business. Here we have the business of this. Somebody like today, I said, if every single person that was here today called me up and said they couldn't come, there's certain things we couldn't do today. Like I told you on the beginning, we had some people scheduled out who said they would be out. So, you know, you can plan for that. Then you have somebody that got flooded in. You can plan as best you can. But if every single person said, oh, can't do it, well, you still wasn't going to get no text from me. Well, you wasn't. I'd have been standing right here. I sure would have because I got a plan. I know how to do it. I'm opening them doors right there, and I just look and say, come on in. Now, the children, you're just going to bring them with you. Because I can't do that, too. I mean, I, I'm sorry, and I know I can't do that. But if you come on in here. And they said, well, who watching, pal? So I turned that monitor around. I can see. And then if somebody walk in here to write, when I'm going to say, look, stand up in front of that monitor. If you see something you don't like, just lock the door. But, but you know, I mean, but, but let me tell you why I'm like this, y'all. Seriously. Because I realized in my life when I was going after things when I was younger, that you couldn't stop me. 
I mean, you couldn't stop me. You couldn't, I, I would work for hours and hours. I would work all day long. Like yesterday, I was here doing some work here up on the roof. I got here at 7.30. I was up on the roof at eight and I didn't come down till five. I mean, I came down to get stuff and back and forth till five. No, no lunch break, wasn't none of that. That's why I don't call you. Cause then they don't you give me ten damn thing, don't feed me. Get you some water. Grab it and come on back up the ladder. Get you some water. You need that so that you don't pass out. I need you to get you some water. But we got work to do. The sun about to go down. And it's raining today and the things that we fi fixed. Yeah, because look what it been today. And then I've been like, oh, well, I guess if I'd have went on to care that. But no, no, no. I knew what I did when I used to have them rent houses I had. Oh, today, if somebody called me and say, my, this ain't working, well, I'm about to go crank my truck up and ride on over there because they ain't going to put up with it. My backyard is flooding, they say. Well, I'm about to get on over there. That's my property, I would say. Oh, yeah, I was going to push out. I'm going to take care of business. That's why, that's just who I was and how I was. Well, how am I going to get up here? And then I get a little drip here, a little drip there. Well, Lord, you know, that's why we got text messages. I'm sure everybody can find something to do today. Really? That's how you're going to do it, white? You talking about the same white who stayed up all night doing Southern business? You talking about the same white that leave home at 6 in the morning and get home at 9 doing Southern's business? That white? Really? That's your excuse? Oh, no, I say. So I knew I had to grind over the very same spirit that I have with that, I got to put it into this. And I got to sell everything. I told him when I die, I'm going to die my boots on and I'm going to do the best that I can to make sure I get what I got to get done. And I have to. I have no choice. I said, Lord, you got to help me to do what it is you're calling me to do. Stephen was full of faith and power. And God was like, stand tall. And that's what I keep saying to myself. Every time I go up that ladder, I just stand tall. I have it on my side. You know, I just, uh, stand tall. And go do what I do and go on back. Get my bucket, go on up, stand tall. Then I had to get them four, four, eight by four sheets of plywood up on the building. Hey, easy by yourself. But I could have called some people. I'm sure they'd have come. But it was like, you know what? Stand tall. Get them up. I did it when I was... But I did it on a rent house. You can do it now. Stand tall. I ain't saying do stupid stuff. I'm just telling you, do what you know you do, though. If you rise up early for that job, rise up early for God. Well, uh, you know, this is the only day I get to sleep in. Really? That's what you're going to tell him? I think he gave me this day. Oh, okay. All right. What you don't want to do is you can't get up. Every time he give you a chance to rise up, you should just rise on up and do it. If he wake you up in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock and your eyes like this and you can't do nothing, I would suggest you get up on out the bed and go pray. Do it. He's giving you a chance. He's giving you a chance. If there are people, folks, I'm telling you, things that are happening to people, it's just like this young lady. It's very unfortunate what happened to her out there. For those of you who don't know, I'm not going to get into the detail, but the one who got run over by the cars, I mean, you know, you know, think about your last thought is drinking alcohol somewhere to the point that maybe you don't even know where you are like that anymore, and then you're involved in something else, and the next thing you know, You'd have been run over by a car and you're dead. And God forbid you're not a Christian. You wake your eyes up, you went into a club knowing where you are, and then you wake up in hell. God's business is a this is the business of God. Our young men will not. I'm just telling you now. If they ever, if I ever have anybody who is a kid up in hell and that happened, and I see their little faces across there. I'm going down to the jail. And I'm sure their dads will come. And we're going to be somebody up in the jail just for being stupid to start. Well, we didn't do nothing. You were stupid for you just stupid. That was just stupid, period. You should never take anybody intoxicated with you anywhere. 
That's just all I would say, because you never know what the intoxicated person gonna say happened anyway. Or you, if you, you just, that was stupid. Don't do that. See, that's why we gotta train these boys now. That stuff you don't do. You don't never do that, never. I wouldn't care, you just some stuff you don't do. They gotta be trained, they gotta be given the word of God, and it's in the Bible. I told somebody, everything that's happening to people, all the stuff that's happening, all of this is in the Bible. That girl is dead today because of alcohol. It don't matter what anybody says. I don't care what happened in the car. It ain't about that, even though it is for the crime situation. But I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that the whole incident, really all of the whole getting run over is because of alcohol. If she had done what she did and she wasn't in a, a drunk, then more than likely she wouldn't have stumbled in the traffic and got run over. That's a different issue what she was doing. But the point is, she had comprehension to be able to walk and get out of the street. If she was so intoxicated, she don't even know where she at. Bam, you get run over by a car. It's all alcohol. And the Bible tells you the evils of alcohol. Tells you what it'll do to you. Tells you what's going to happen. Tells you how it can do this to you. The Bible tells you what goes on with this. And, 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 and what? People say the Bible's not relevant. God's business is about making this relevant in the lives of at least our kids and our family so they understand this thing will keep you. Yeah, I mean, they talking about, well, if you watch the video, she ran behind them. Well, the Bible say, that, look, oh, that wasn't even my speak today, but I'm about to go over here. Let me, let me see this. Talking about, well, she ran behind them. I wouldn't care. This what the Bible say. This what the Bible say. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 11 through seven, uh, 18. 11 through 18. Let's look at these verses. Now, this is not to impugn her. This is to impugn anyone who would say, well, she ran after them. This is what it says. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, so we see that, from the man that speaketh forward things, so if your boys is encouraging you, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who's rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they, they are forward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman. Okay, so she running behind you. She's strange, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Ooh, you cute. Ooh, whatever. I don't care what she's saying. You need to go home, son. You need to leave her there and go. Don't let her get in the car with you. Which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house inclines unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Look at what then happened. Now you're up for a crime. Minimum 25 years. No probation. No time served, etc. Why? It don't matter how it happened, but if it's determined that's what happened, <laughs> it don't, you know, and the Bible tells you to stay out of the path of the wicked. It talks about alcohol, tells you what's going on. If that's God's business. That's why I go home and try to figure out, okay, I'm watching these kids and I'm seeing these young men grow up. And the ones that are over there today, the all of them are at least 10. All of them, they men, uh, I mean, to me, they almost, they mean, what they probably see in here when they go to school. So it's time, don't get me wrong, they got the ladies over there teaching them, but you know what? I think in the back of their mind, they probably like, <laughs> we ain't cheering. Yeah, you want a pop tart? Sure, I'll take one. But they kind of like, hmm, they doing what they can, but the reality is they're boys. Growing into men, and somebody better explain to them how a man needs to act. A Christ-like man. Because if you don't, the outside, no matter what people are telling you, it ain't very kind to you. And everybody keeps talking about the police and what they're doing to people. But all I'm telling you is there's some police that, that made up their mind. Stop means stop. People say, well, they charging them with murder. It don't matter. You dead. 
Yeah, y'all, you dead now because you didn't do what you were told. I get it, but you got to understand authority. You got to learn how that works because every time you undermine authority, you undermine your own. People just need to understand that. If you undermine authority, every time you do it, you undermine your own because you are demonstrating your inability to submit to authority. So God's going to be like, you know what? If you can't submit to authority, I'm not going to make you one. That for sure. It's not going to happen. Now, there are reasons sometimes not to submit to things. Got it. But not all the time. Some people go to work. They can't do nothing. They both tell them. They just can't because they just can't be told nothing. Some people can't do what their parents tell them. Why? They just can't be told nothing. No matter how you try to explain it, they just won't listen. They got their own ideas. Well, at some point, you're never going to get what it is you want because God's not going to do it. That's not. So it's our responsibility. It's part of God's business. I can't be. See, I got to the point I had to realize now I'm too busy for the business God got me to do now. I got to make a decision. I have to make a choice. My wife and I, we were talking, just kind of joking around the other day one, at one point. She was talking about somebody and she was saying that, you know, they were 80 years old and she was just going on about some of the things that was happening. And, 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 and when she said it a couple of times and I, would, I said, you know what, man, um, what is it? Uh, I said, in 18 years, that'll be me. I said, do you know how many people I've seen grow up in this church? Little kids that are now going to college and graduating. I said in 18 years, that means the next baby, when Harry's daughter and April's daughter is 18, has to be 80. Time is short to me. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to give some thought to what does this mean? What do you do? You got to get about God's business. I mean, there comes a point where you can't work. And you just got to decide. See, I came to that point where I realized you either just need to go on with Southern and just be through with this here. Let the church go. It deserves, God deserves full-time effort. Just let it go. Or go do it. And that's what made me make the decision. Because I read what Jesus said. And I would expect him to say, did you really? You chose that? Wow. I hope it works for you. This I expect to work. And work don't mean, oh, it got to be time. I don't care about that. I'm talking about work, that, that, that I live in peace, I have joy, and God will do what I would like to see done in my life in terms of those kinds of things. And I have that. And I believe that God, this is what it means when we get about his business. I want you to, I want to, I want to close with something. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 through 31. To me, this is one of the most sobering deals. You know, Paul had been talking to the Corinthian church and they had asked, were asking him about all kind of things, you know, should they be getting divorced and how should they get divorced and can they get divorced and what about this sin and that sin, all kind of questions they were asking him. So Paul finally in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 through 31, he comes back and he says this. He says, but this I say. Well, well let me, um, can, can you put up verse 28? No, don't put it up. I'm going to just read it. I'm going to read verse 28. All right. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that had wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. See, time is always short. So when Paul was speaking to these people and they were going on about should you get married and can you get married and who can you marry and all, Paul said, look, let me make it clear to y'all. He said the time is short, basically. He says it would be better for the one who is married he says to act like he ain't even married. Now, that doesn't mean abuse your wife. None. That ain't what his point. His point was saying you weren't about the wrong thing and you're spending too much time thinking about this stuff. He says, because the time is short. He says, those who buy things, you might as well act like you ain't owning nothing. He said, you need to understand what's going on. And then this is what's so interesting about it. First Corinthians was written in 53 to 54 AD. Do you know? that 13 to 14 years later, 
Jerusalem was totally destroyed. The temple, the Romans came in and just ransacked the entire country and dispelled all the Jews everywhere. And the church was then in a whole nother level of persecution. Now, I think what the Holy Spirit recognized was, hey, y'all weren't about the wrong thing. In 13 years, this place going to be toast. There's not going to be one thing left. Like Jesus said, there wouldn't be one stone left on another. 13 years from the time he told them this, complete destruction. Can you imagine somebody who had decided, well, I ain't going to sell everything I got. I, I, I got. I got a future. I got a plan. I got a goal. And then all of a sudden, 13 years later, all of it destroyed. Wow. So don't look, the people don't look so stupid who sold everything they had and brought it to the apostles' feet and left it at the church. Because the reality is <laughs> everything was destroyed. So they sold it, converted it to money, threw it in the church. The church did whatever they did. And then when the time came, Jesus had given them the sign to leave Jerusalem. They left and the whole place was destroyed. See, we don't know what's going to happen in our future. Just like today, man, a little rain. Everybody like, oh, my God. The street done flooded. Can you imagine if this went on for a couple weeks? Yeah, can you imagine if God just said, you know what? I just about had all I stand of people not understanding. And just let it rain about three weeks. Just like it's raining right now. Don't never stop the rain. Just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Can you imagine? We all float away. Now, now would people swim here? They might. Pastor, we need to pray. We need to stop this rain because it ain't stopping. Where else we going to go? But to God. But we don't want to wait till the end. We go to God and handle his business when things are right, when things are well. And when we do that, folks, God, I'm telling you, will take care of everything you need. I'm telling y'all, I'm going to close with this. I remember this morning when my wife told me it was so funny. I was like, uh, I said, okay. And I said, well, it's certain time. She said, you got time. I think her point was, you need to get up over this house and take care of this business. I understand what you're doing. And she was right. And, and, and so I said, well, Lord, look, I need to go take care of that. So I, I, I got in the car. And y'all, I ain't lying. You and I talked about this the other day. Every single light all the way down Airline Highway with green. I was all the way on. I was just like, really? Come on now. I, this ain't never had more Airline Highway. Every light, I just drove through the lights and went on around, did what I had to do. I even took my clothes off and put some other ones on and went outside and did what I had to do, come back in, got dressed, and went on back to church. All the lights was green. All the way I was like, see, now this the God I like serving. I mean, you know, he can take care of your business and you can take care of his, and God is good all the way. Look, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you today again for the opportunity just to come into your house. I thank you for your people that are here, those who were unable to press out because of weather problems and everything. I pray and ask that you would help them, Father, and watch over them and anything that's flooding or whatever the case might be. Give them what's necessary in order for them to be able to take care of those situations. And Father, those who did not press out, for whatever reason it might be, we pray, Father, your divine favor upon their life, that they might come to understand that it's only because of you that we have access to life and we have it more abundantly. Father, let us be about your business and let us be able to recognize the distinction between ours and yours. Let us never be too busy for your business. Father, we ask it even now in Jesus' name, amen. Look, God bless you all again. Thank every one of you all who are here. We're gonna go ahead and sign off online. Don't forget out there, Sunday service, 10 a.m., Sunday live stream. We started at already 1020. Sunday message this afternoon, we'll be out there chatting 3 o'clock. And prayer service, 6 to 8. Bible study, 7 o'clock. Communion service every first Sunday. So look, God bless you all. Have a great week out there. Thank you for joining us online.